I appreciate the kids who will come and attend class so they can see all the things their parents didn't do right. Thank you. I'm not really sure where we're at with the bell, so I'm probably just going to start. I mean, the bell is so long. So long. Farewell. I do. At least I did. Uh, we're gonna. We'll just jump in. If the bell rings, I'll start over. Um, I can't. Can't go before the bell. Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Hope everybody had good holiday uh, break. But back to the grind. Just kidding. Um, so tonight, I want to spend some time um, talking about identity. Uh, it's a subject, especially with our kids, that I think, I don't know, even when I started reading this chapter, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how practical this feels. Uh, but the more and more I read about it, the more I feel like it's, it's something we need to spend time talking about. Because obviously there are lots of different times in life when people can walk away from their faith. But without a doubt, like the most, the time most young people walk away from their faith is that college, those college years. Um, and a large part of that is because they go off to college and they want to find themselves. Who am I? It is a question a lot of young people have for themselves. And I think it's important for us to talk about identity because we live in a culture that tells kids, like, you need to find out who you are and you can be whoever or whatever you want to be. And they're these seeds are planted in our young people's minds that your identity is based on all these different things. Uh, and you get kids who base their identity on their gender, or they base their identity on their achievements, or they base their identity on some career choice or who their family is. And I think it's important, and hopefully... Uh, you agree. I think it's important for us to instill at a very young age for our kids that our identity is not found in those things. Our identity is found in Christ. Uh, we are valuable not because of those other areas, uh, but because of who we belong to. Um, and so in Ephesians chapter 2, this is a passage we looked at last week for a different reason, but Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, other translations talk about not just his workmanship, but uh, I think there's a version that says we're his masterpiece. Just a, a very uh, like paraphrased version of it. And it's the idea that God created us, not just at creation, created man, but each individual uh, when we are in Christ, we are we're created new, and we are, we are given value. And that's where our value comes from, from Christ. And the reason why that's so important is because we have young people who spend their life going to church, and a lot of their spiritual identity is actually not their own. It's mom and dad's, or it's a youth minister's, or it's their preacher's. And they hold on to that until they get out of the house, and then they look at it, and they're like, this isn't mine. I want to find out who I am. And then they start to explore, and they turn to all sorts of different things to find out who they are. Sometimes kids find who they think they are. I am, and they're defined by a sport, or they're defined by a hobby, or they're defined by something else uh, in their life. Our hope is that when our kids get older and graduate, yes, they're still maturing in their faith, uh, but their identity is always going to be rooted in Jesus, not in these other things. And so I know all of that is kind of up here, and, and we're going to work as we go through this to kind of make it more practical. Um, but that's what I want us to talk about tonight, is this idea of helping our kids form their identity and not just find themselves in the sense like what are your talents and gifts but helping them to find themselves in Christ that identity that's found with with God uh, so that when they graduate and go off and begin their own faith journey uh, 
they have that root that's connected uh, and then they can grow from there. So I mentioned this last week. These, these lessons, we're going to kind of break them down this, the same way. The first part of class, we're going to talk about some findings that they uh, discovered when they did some of these surveys and all with young people. Uh, and then at the, the second part of class, we'll look at some practical stuff. So first is these sticky findings is what they call them. Just some things they found to be true based on all these different surveys. Uh, number one, uh, when it comes to identity formation, as they call it, they say identity formation is affected by brain development. And what they mean by that is as your kids are at different stages developmentally, um, obviously their identity is going to be different. Uh, I see this all the time with like our middle school kids. You'll have two middle schoolers who are super, super close friends. And then as they mature, you see them kind of get to that point where you're like, ah, you are kind of discovering who you are. And suddenly you're very different than the person that you were good friends with. Some of you can maybe even think back on someone that you were super, super close with at a young age. And then at some point you were like, ah, I'm different. We, we have different interests. We have, and so part of their identity is it changes as their brain uh, develops. Look, I am not a scientist. Uh, that should not shock anyone in this room. Um, but it's been proven that young people's brains are not truly developed uh, until early to mid-20s. Uh, they say because of technology and because of social interactions now, it's later than it's been in a, in a very, very long time. And some of you may be thinking, no, that can't be true. And some of you are like, yep, I interact with young 20s all the time. And, and they're not. <laughs> Especially true with men. Yeah, absolutely. Look, guys tend to develop uh, slower than, I'm 37. So I'm like trying to hold that 25 average, push it towards the upper ranges. Um, unfortunately, it turns out my brain is fully developed. This is it. This is as, as good as it's going to get. I just kept, it's like that growth spurt I'm waiting on. It's just, it's not coming. Um, the scary part of that is most of our young people are making the major decisions of their life in times when they haven't even fully developed their brains yet. Uh, what I'm going to do for a career, who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, uh, who my, my religious beliefs, those things all begin at a time when our kids are still developing. Uh, and, and that's okay. I don't think that we're supposed to be like, well, you got to wait till your brain is, is fully developed before you can d decide some of those things. There is a maturing that takes place during it. Uh, but it is a good reminder for us that just because your kid was a good, faithful kid in high school and you've launched them, they're like, ah, good to go. They're still developing. They're still developing their, for, uh, their identity. They're forming that. And so as much as I know there are some parents who it's like they, we get them out of the house and it's like, ah, done. Wash my hands. It's like our job's not over. Uh, we need to continue to be working on our, uh, on our kids and helping them form who they are because a 14-year-old is going to be very different from a 25-year-old, but within that whole span, we're developing. We are finding out who we are. And I think for most of us, if we think back on our own lives, that makes sense. My 20s, my early 20s, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. Carrie's usually making, calling the shots because I'm like, sure, whatever. Uh, and I can think back on times where I'm like, okay, that's when I kind of finally felt grounded. Like, this is who I am. Uh, this is what I believe. And so this finding is, is just a reminder for us that our kids are still maturing. If you have a 17-year-old who you're like, man, there are days where they act like a 12-year-old and there are days where they act like a 25-year-old. That's very normal. Uh, that, that's part of the developmental process. And so that identity formation is going to be affected by that, that development uh, of their brain. Just a reminder. Second part of this, and also important, that identity formation is a long and winding process. And what I mean by that is it's not this fixed line in which kids are just at the same rate, growing, growing, and then suddenly they just know who they are. 
We have kids who go through phases where they're really confident in who they are uh, with their faith, and then suddenly, boom, the bottom falls out, and they don't know what they're doing anymore. And then they may come back up, and then they're back down. It, it's a process. Um, I have people in my life that it's, it's been a roller coaster. There are times where they're very confident in who they are. Uh, I, I belong to Christ. I, have, I don't have any worries about who I am. And then all of a sudden there are doubts and questions and it's back to square one. And so this is a process. We need to be patient with our kids, especially when our kids are in that really young developmental stage. Um, I know, <laughs> trust me, I know. It's really easy to interact with middle schoolers and be like, why can't you just like grow up? Like, and then I remember middle school Jeremy and it's like a nightmare. I'm like, I have so many people I should write notes to and say, I'm sorry. Uh, they're, they're kids, they are kids. And I'll, all the time, we'll be talking to Carrie about all oh, this group of boys, they're blah, blah, blah. And then I'll have to remind myself, these are kids. They are growing, they're still trying to figure out who they are. Uh, we have a guy in our youth group right now, great kid. There are days where I'm like, wow, he, he knows exactly who he is. He's confident. And then the next time I see him, it's like a different person. And, and it's, that's normal. Uh, we need to be patient with our kids and helping them uh, figure out who they are and specifically whose they are. All right. And then third, Look, I promise we're going to get to some practical stuff. These are just some things that are important for laying the kind of foundation. I don't like this. I'm not saying, like, be okay with this. But it's just a fact that a lot of our college students are often, as they say, shelve their faith for a while. I don't want that to sound like your faith is something you can just put on a shelf. Like, I can pull my faith off and now I'm going to do the faith thing for a while. But... It is a very normal thing for our young people to graduate, go off to college, kind of put aside their faith as they're trying to discover who they are and then come back to it. I don't say that because you should be like, oh yeah, who cares? Let them do whatever they want. Um, but I do think there are parents who as soon as that happens, they think it's over, I've lost my kids. Be with them, help, help them work through that stage um, because Usually, not usually, sometimes what it is, is it's not a complete rejection of their faith. It's just, they've reached a point where they realize, well, this wasn't just my faith, this was someone else's. And so it's not that they're putting it away altogether, they're just trying to decide if it's really theirs. Uh, and so we want to be patient with them through that process. I think our natural reaction is to, like, oh, you need to be at church, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. And the more we hammer them like that, the more they're going to feel like, oh, yeah, this is their faith. This isn't mine. Uh, we want to nurture. Certainly we want to encourage them and we want to push them. Uh, but we need to remind ourselves that, hey, it, it is not uncommon for kids to graduate from high school and go through a phase where they're like, hey, was this something I just did because my parents wanted me to do it? Or, or was this really my own? Um, and so don't be... Look, I hope nobody's, I hope your kids, they graduate and they're just rock solid for all time. But I have friends I went to college with, went off, did their own thing. Uh, I have a buddy who we grew up in Colorado. Great friend, used to stay over at our house all the time. We figured like buddies for a lifetime. We got to college, he went a very different route. And I was like, oh man, that's, he's, just, he's done with it. And now he's a preacher. And I'm like, okay, he figured it out. He just needed to work his way through some things. Uh, he didn't stop believing in God, but he kind of put things on hold as he figured out if that was really who he was uh, and not just who his family was. So these are just some things they found. Let's get into the practical stuff because I always feel like that's going to be more helpful for us. So this is what's most important. First of all, we need to remember that our children are God's beloved creation. That's who they are. Um, we as parents need to be very careful of assigning our children's identity based on any, anything else. Um, Darcy and Penny are, are very different. Uh, Darcy likes to 
uh, sing and is very like particular about the way things are done. She'll go in and she'll be playing the keyboard and she's like making music, but it's very scripted and always a certain way. And Penny is our free spirit. She's just like, whatever, like I'm going to do whatever I want to do. We went skiing over Christmas. Darcy is a pro because she like knows the position of your legs and everything. And like I turn and Penny's just like laying in the snow and eating <laughs> and eating it. And I have the tendency to want to like l label my kids. Penny is the free spirited kid. Uh, and I may even talk to him that way. Like, oh, Penny, you're, you're just the, the funny, you know, goofy one. And Darcy's, it, it's fine to know like what, what your kids' personalities are. But sometimes we give our kids their identity and then that just forever, they feel like that's who they are. Um, and we need to be finding ways constantly to remind our kids that this is who they are. That passage in Ephesians 2.10 where it says, uh, we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ for good works. We were, we were made by God. That's where our value comes from. Um, and it's because we belong to Christ that we have value. And so we need to be looking for ways to just remind our kids that the reason you're valuable is not because of what you've done, not because of some great personality trait. The reason we are valuable is because we're God's. He created us. Um, as soon as it's merit-based or achievement-based or activity-based, we're never going to reach those standards. And so we, we want our kids to remember this first and foremost. They are God's beloved creation. That's where their value comes from. Um, Darcy is naturally a better student than Penny is because Darcy is particular about how she does things and Penny is Velcroing her hair to the carpet at school. That's true. That is what Penny does at school. And it would be easy for Penny old, later in life to think like, well, I'm not as good because I'm not the student that Darcy is. Uh, and if we're not careful about playing those things up too much, that becomes their identity. Well, I'm the dumb child or I, I'm just I'm just the goofy kid. She's the smart kid. I'm the goofy kid. Like I want my children's identity to be rooted in Christ. No matter how I do in school, I have value because of Christ. No matter how I do in sports, I have value because of Christ. That's, that's what their identity is. All right. And so that's the, the foundation, the number one most important part of this. Um, but here's some other practical things. Number two, we need to treat each child as an individual. And some of you have multiple kids and you know, kids are very, very different. Uh, my dad and mom had five kids and a couple of us, I mean, Daniel and I, we could probably just switch lives and no one would know the difference. I worked at OC for two years and then he worked at OC for two years. I'm pretty sure everyone just thought it was the same guy for four years working there. Like, oh, this guy, now he has a beard, great. Um, but other siblings, very different. Like we are very, very different. And my dad used to talk about that passage, you know, uh, train up a child in the way he should go. Uh, when he is older, he will not depart from it. And he would talk about the idea that's not just like train up, a ch train up kids in the way they need to go, but it's also train up each child in the way they should go. Like each child is different. Um, I have to approach my kids differently uh, and understand that who they are uh, is going to affect who they want to be someday. And so when I'm dealing with Penny and Darcy, they both handle things very differently. Uh, and when it comes to their identity, obviously they're at a very young age. Darcy and Penny don't sit around thinking like, who am I? Who am I really? Um, but as they get older, that's a question kids have. Uh, they may not verbally say it, uh, but those middle school and high school years, kids are trying to find out who they are. They're going to hang out with certain groups, find out if it feels right. They're going to try different activities. And sometimes you see a kid when they seem to like fall in that right group of friends and they're like, ah, oh, yeah, th this is who I am. Uh, and we need to remember that because kids are differently, they're going to form their identity differently as well. And so while Darcy, I can just sit and say like, you know, remember that you're a child of God and you have value in that. And she hears that and just like, because daddy says it, she's like, yes, that's truth. Penny, 
and I, I, I handle it differently. Uh, these are things that as we have difference in personalities and everything, we need to just remember to treat our children as individuals. They're very different. Uh, there's no one approach for all kids, and some of you, you get that. Uh, your kids are different, and uh, we have to handle that differently, the identity process. Uh, number three, oh, it's not up on the screen. Look, I'm going to be a big advocate of this one. Uh, use your community to develop personal identity. So this is not a 100% all the time, always true, but for the most part, kids that spend time around other Christian kids are going to develop a spiritual identity. Uh, I've had families that come to me before and they're like, my kid doesn't want to have anything to do with spiritual things. They don't feel like it's their faith. And I, I can't say it to them, but I want to say it's because your kids are never around spiritual people other than at home. And there is a real benefit to spending time with other Christians. Um, yes, sometimes our teenagers can be knuckleheads. I get that. But all teenagers are knuckleheads. And I would rather my kids spend time with knuckleheads that are at least somewhat spiritually focused than the knuckleheads that they're going to just hang out with at school. And so that's not to say they can't have relationships at school and everything, but this is super important. I mentioned the first week that uh, the home is where a lot of this needs to take place. Uh, and I think we have gotten in a bad habit of trying to just shift the responsibility of raising our kids onto the church or onto schools when it should be the home. But there are some ways that the church can be a real resource to helping raise our kids, and this is one of them. Uh, and we have kids who have grown up and gone through the youth group and graduated with a good, solid identity in Christ because they spent time with other kids. And so some of you have really, really young kids. And I love when I get to see, I mean, I came into the office and... <laughs> For Andrew Kirby came walking through, and he had like 18 girls, little girls following him. And I'm like, Andrew, you don't have this many kids. Uh, and it's because all those girls just love to be around each other. And like, I know it seems like simple. It's like, yeah, it's just kids, but that is so important. And as they grow and they spend more time together, that helps them develop who they are. Part of the reason I am who I am today is because of the people I spent time with. Uh, and I'm sure that's true for all of us. And so if you want your kids to have a, an, an identity in Christ, you've got to find ways to get your kids to spend time with others in that community. Um, like I said, I'm going to push for that, not just because I'm the youth minister and like I need kids to show up. Trust me, if like two kids show up for a lock-in, that's great for me. I'm like, just go sit over there and play Monopoly and I'm going to take a nap over here. Um, this is super important. When we do things, so Craig, you've been on our, our mission trip to Denver with us. We, we do a high school mission trip to Denver. Part of the reason that trip is valuable is, yes, kids get to learn, like, the benefit of hard work. And, like, we've done yard work in that, on that mission trip that I'm sure Jackson Clark still wakes up with PTSD from, like, grass up to your neck. It's just wild. And that, that's important. But... Part of why those trips are so valuable is just kids getting to be around other kids who have a spiritual focus. It's so important. Uh, this idea that I can be religious without the church, and it's just, you're not going to find that in Scripture. Uh, we are called to be with one another, uh, to build one another up, uh, to carry one another's burdens. And so use your community. Now, that may not just look like the youth group. Uh, that may be, I mean, you've got a circle of friends here at church and you let, the, let your kids spend time together. That, that's important. Um, sometimes the best thing you can do to help your kids develop that identity in Christ is to let them be around other kids who are trying to do the same. Uh, so use your community to develop personal identity. All right. Number four, the word rituals always sounds like, I don't know, like I'm a priest with incense. Uh, I, it just means habits. So use these rituals in life to reinforce identity. Uh, 
We were sitting around last week talking about New Year's resolutions, or as Penny calls them, New Year's revolutions. And I was like, that sounds dangerous. I want to be a part of it. Uh, talking about, like, hey, what would we like to do? And I can't remember which kid said, but it would be good to just each day make sure we, we spend time reading the Bible. I was like, that's great. And so they, they decided that when Darcy goes to take her shower each night, Penny, she's going to sit and read. And then when they switch, Darcy will read. It's not long. My kids don't shower very long, and so it's not tons of time. Um, but it's, it's good practice for them to know, like, this is part of who I am. Each day I just sit down and I, I spend some time in God's Word. And, man, today I walk through and Carrie is getting ready and Penny's just sitting up on the bathtub reading from this little Bible she's got. And it wasn't even shower time. So it's those rituals are already becoming a part of who she is. Um, we can't expect our kids to have an identity in Christ if their life never has anything to do with Christ. If all they know is, well, we go to church on Sundays, uh, that's not who they're going to be. Uh, we have kids that come through the youth group who, if I ask them, who, who are you? Like, how would you define yourself? You're going to get kids who say, I'm, I'm a baseball player. That's who I am. You're going to get kids who say, I'm a musician, or I am the funny kid, or I am the serious one. And all. I, I want, when we ask our kids, like, who are you, for them to say, I'm a child of God. That's who I am. Uh, I belong to Christ. And so we use these rituals to reinforce that. Um, I love the theme this year. I didn't come up with it, but I think it's a, a great way for us to not just for our own personal growth, uh, but also for the growth of our kids to show them the importance of these, these rituals, these habits, um, a lot of which we probably most aren't very good about using. We're really good at the whole scripture and prayer thing, and then we get into some of those other spiritual disciplines, and it's like, eh, no thank you. Fasting? Are you kidding me? Uh, what month is that? It's not November, right? August. August, okay. Honestly, Oh my goodness, not again. I can't fast from watermelon again. Honestly, that's after June and July, so I usually go into a little bit of a post-summer coma anyways, so I could probably fast. But those are, those are important for our kids. Uh, kids are very habit-oriented. Uh, they, they build those habits, and it becomes part of who they are. Not just something they do, but it becomes part of who they are. And so if you want your kids to have a spiritual identity, those, those habits, those rituals are things you can build in early. We mentioned them, uh, some of them the last couple weeks, but even things as simple as when you have dinner together, just talking about how their day went and, and trying to make some spiritual connections with some of that. Uh, Carrie, several years ago, started doing a thing at dinner where we call it high-low buffalo. It's just like, what was your high of the day? And everybody goes around and say the best thing that happened all day. And what was your low? And we talk about something that was not so great. And we may ask some questions. And the buffalo is just something weird that happened during the day. And some days Darcy's like, my high was this right here. And my low was I didn't really have a low. And my buffalo is I don't really have a buffalo. And it's like, well, that's hard to really talk about. <laughs> um, but those are great moments for your kids to just be able to open up and then you be able to talk about spiritual things with them um, and just build those rituals, those habits into their life so it becomes a part of who they are. Can I, let me ask a question. Yes, sir. Because the reason I'm in here, and I'm one reason aside. So are, are you talking mostly to young, young, young kids? Or, because here's the deal. I've, Take home, you know, we used to have a little Bible, a little verses, different colored cards out there. Sure. So take them home, have him read those, try to memorize those with kids. I feel like I may have beat him over the head too much with it, you know, sure. and so it's to the point where, you know, I've studied the Bible day or day, you know, and you don't want to be that uh, to where you drive them away from it, but at the same time, it's Sure. If you drop the high low buffalo on Clayton, he's going to be like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> I get that. Since I've been a teenager, so. Right. So here, here's. I have no idea what they're. You're right. They're, I get it. They're not going to They're, they're stupid. They, they are. <laughs> but, and, and like, I'm not just speaking 
to your kid, I'm speaking to a lot of kids, but they have good hearts. And like, I, I was a knucklehead. I mean, I, I, the fact that I am standing before you all today alive it is a miracle. <laughs> it is. Uh, there are so many people in life who could have and probably should have just knocked me out. And I am thankful that they showed patience and kindness with me because kids, for the most part, are knuckleheads. Uh, you be patient with them. Uh, to answer your question, no, like you're, you're not going to sit down at dinner with Clayton or a teenager probably and be like, what's your buffalo for the day, bud? No, not, you, know, you know what I mean? I but just, my, my advice... When he goes to Colorado, how much he enjoys it. But then other times, I'm really like, I need to go to Colorado every week. I know. And that, that's, that's what I mean when I say that identity formation is a long and winding process. There are going to be days where you're like, my, my kid is crushing it. Like, yes, thank you. This is who I want you to be. And then he's going to wake up the next day and you're like, what did you do with my son? Where's the kid from yesterday? He was great. Uh, that, that's normal. You just keep working on him. Um, especially with this ritual stuff. Look, we, we have this tendency to want to compartmentalize. Okay, now we're shifting into spiritual stuff. And we're going to do the spiritual things. All right, and then back to it. Kids like Clayton, older kids... It's just in your everyday conversations with them. Man, I know Clayton loves baseball. And, and we're going to talk here in a second about using those activities to discover who they are. Not just who I am as a baseball player, but who I am in Christ. Because you guys know, as you spend time around other people, in whether it's sports or hobbies or whatever it may be, you, you find out who you are when, when you interact with people. So look, some of you have really, really little kids, and you're like, oh, yeah, I got plenty of time. And some of you, your kids are older, and I understand that, that feeling of, like, uh, I feel like they need to get, get their tail in gear. But I'm telling you. Uh, I have a semester left. It's kind of scary. <laughs> it is scary. But even that, like, no, you don't. You have a, a semester left with them at home. Um, but it, it's a process, and they're going to be still growing. And... Look, I've got people that I know in my life that the, the greatest spiritual growth that they ever went through was after they left home. And that's okay. The foundation was set for that to take place. Um, that's why that number three is so important. Yes. After, you, after high school. Absolutely. After, I, I talk to my kids about that. I encourage them to continue to find people even after they're gone and on their own. Yeah, I, I get teased frequently. So, like, on Thursdays, I go to lunch with this group of guys, and half of them are guys I've literally known my entire life. Uh, my brother and a handful of other guys, we grew up together. And I'm just telling you, that group of guys is why I am who I am today. For better or worse, <laughs> that's why I am who I am today. And I am thankful that I still have that. And if the only spiritual source for your kids is you, Kids naturally, when they graduate, want a little bit of space. And if you were their only sport, uh, source of spiritual encouragement, yeah, they're going to be like, ah, this is great out here. I was very blessed that when I went off to school at OC, I had buddies that had I been like, I'm going to go do this. They're like, no, you're not. That's, that's stupid, and we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to go do this thing. And it's stupid, but it's like not sinful stupid. It's just like, why are you sliding down the stairs on a mattress stupid? Um, <laughs> And the answer was because the other guys were already using the shopping cart. So we got to get the. Um, but look, Bobby and, and all of you, we're all at different phases. I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. You've got a 16-year-old. Very, very different places. I want to go back to something I said that first week is it's never too late. It is never too late to start forming uh, that spiritual identity within your kids. It may be harder. It may take more work. Um, but it's never too late. As long as your kids still have breath in their lungs, God can work on them in their heart. And, and just so you all know, I work with the youth group. I spend a lot of time with your kids. For those of you who your kids are in the youth group, I can tell you from interacting with them. None of them are a lost cause. None of them. They all have good hearts. They're trying to grow. Uh, we just got to keep looking for ways to, to help them do that. Um, all right. We're going to fly here, and that's okay. Uh, number five, also super important, help your child grow through hardship. We have, look, there's different types of parents. There's the 
kid falls down a hill and you know, rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. And then there's the, the kid was never on the hill because he's in bubble wrap at home and he's protected. Uh, very, look, I get there's different parenting styles. We need to get away from any parenting style that attempts to protect our kids from any type of hardship. Look, I love my kids. I don't want them to go through pain. But the older I get, the more I realize that it's good for them sometimes. Uh, I don't, that's not like I'm praying each morning, Lord, rough them up today. <laughs> Just rough them up. Um, but our kids need to know what it's like to go through hard times because I can speak from experience, and I'm sure a lot of you can too. The greatest moments of spiritual formation in my life came during hard times. Uh, that's when you really find out who you are. Oh, you're a Christian? Well, what about when the bottom drops out? Oh, <laughs> pass. Uh, it's those times where things are hard, where things are challenging, where your kids are going to truly find out who they are. And so instead of trying to shelter them and, oh, don't do that. And, oh, don't do that. Let me, let me always protect you. Walk alongside them. And when those hard times happen, be right there on their, by their side. Talk them through it. Hey, what, what are you learning about yourself through this? What are you learning about God through this experience? Um, James says that we should count it all, I, I hate that passage, count it all joy when I go through these things? Yeah, uh, because that's when you truly find out who you are. It's when you mature and you grow. And so rather than always being these helicopter parents that are just like always protecting our kids, sometimes we need to, look, you can have a leash still. Let's let them out a little bit. Uh, let them, not say just throw them in the deep end. Yeah, they'll figure it out. Uh, but we need to give our kids space to get hurt and to go through hard times and then help them through it. I, I have not gone through some of the things that I know parents in this room have gone through. So it may be easy for me to stand up and say, let your go kids go through hard times. It's not easy on you as a parent to sit and watch your kids go through hard times. But I promise you that that's when spiritual growth takes place. And that's when they find out, do I really believe these things? Or is this just something I've done because up to this point, it's been easy. So help your kids grow through that. Hey, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Because we live in the Western world, sometimes our kids think that means an individual experience. Correct. And sometimes we, we, we as parents think that means an individual experience. But in reality, that's best done relationally. Mm. You know, with support of family, friends, faith community, mentors. To, to like help prepare them for the hardships, help them get through the hardships, and then help them process the hardships on the other side of it. Yeah. And so all that is even done relationally. Yeah, that's such a good point. We, we tend to think of conflict or challenges almost like full house style. Like there's one episode and the conflict is introduced in the episode and then we work it out and by the end of the episode, dad's sitting on the bed hugging everyone and then guess what? By the next episode, that's not a problem anymore. It's been, you know what I mean? Uh, it is. It, it is a process. It, it's not just a one-time moment. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great point, Mel. Thanks for saying that. Uh, all right, that was our first bell, as I always tell the teens. They don't care. They don't care. They're like, there could be 16 bells. We hear the first bell, it's over. Uh, use extracurricular activities to explore identity. I don't mean... Help your kids find out if they are football kid. Help your kids find out if they are violin girl. Um, I mean, use those situations for them to determine, to figure out who they are in Christ. Uh, we have kids who play sports. Sports can be a great thing. Uh, it can be a great way for you to learn conflict management, uh, how to follow, how to be a leader. There are really good parts to that. The problem is we have a lot of kids who they think, well, the only reason this extracurricular activity is going to matter is if I do this, is if I make the team, or if I score a touchdown, or if I'm this good. Coming from a person who is not good at sports, <laughs> if my identity was based on what I was able to do on a sport field, whew, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble. Some of you would fare a little bit better, and that's fine. Um, but use these things to help them find out who they are in Christ. 
If you've got a kid who is trash at sports, that's okay. They can still learn about working with the team and how to treat other people and how to deal with frustrations. Because if they're like me, it doesn't matter how bad you are at sports, you're still mad that you're not good. And so you got to learn how to have self-control. And so use those things to help them form their identity. Uh, what that means is we've got to be careful about being the parents who talk up the, well, if, if you would just get more playing time. Well, now, now they feel like that's who I need to be. I'm not going to matter unless I get more playing time. I'm not going to matter unless I make first chair. I'm not going to matter unless I'm chosen to be on this specific group. I'm not going to matter unless I get these grades. Those are things we got to be careful about. I'm not saying that we shouldn't push our kids to give their best uh, and try to be the best version of themselves they can. Uh, but use those activities to help them figure out who they are in Christ rather than using those activities to help them find their identity within those things. Does that make sense? I think you have to work with them through those activities to set boundaries in place. You say, you can be good at this, but if you're not, if you're lacking in your faith or if you're not going to church because you're going to a sporting event, then you're probably working out. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of parents that, like, oh, we've got all this stuff going on. We can, we're not going to make it to church. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they graduate and they don't want to come to church and we're like, I don't know what happened. I'm like, yeah, you do. You know exactly what happened. You, you taught your kids that this isn't important or it's, it's less important. Uh, so you got to be mindful of those things. All right, real quick, a couple more. This is similar to the last one. Um, affirm character growth more than academic achievement. Look, I want my kids to try in school. I want them to work hard. But I just know, coming from a kid whose school came very easily to him, it's not fair. I know that. I could sit down, read through just a sheet of paper that the test is going to be over, and then go in and do very well on the test. I'm just blessed with a very good memory. My brother could sit and study and study and study and study and get in to take the test and be like, I've never seen any of this material before. Um, he can't control that I'm smarter than him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He got the beard, I got the smarts, and the looks, and the athleticism. Wait, I already said I'm not good at sports. Um, we want our kids to give their best. Uh, but again, like sports, we, we got to be careful about setting the standard that what's acceptable is all A's, or what's acceptable is you, you do this well. I want my kids to try really hard. Uh, and so when Penny comes home and shows off something that she's done at school, Instead of saying like, oh, good job, you got 100, I want to shift and say something like, hey, Penny, I'm glad you worked really hard on this. I'm proud of you for working so hard. And you can say that whether they got 100 or whether they got a 60 because they just really have a hard time with tests, all right? Now, that's not saying that your kid's lazy and he doesn't want to study for school. They come home and you're like, I'm really proud of you, buddy. Sometimes your kids, you got to be like, hey, get, get to work. Um, but affirm that character growth more than academic achievement. Look, we don't have enough time to deal with this one, which is unfortunate because it's the most important. Uh, so we'll touch on it next week. But if you want your kids to develop a spiritual identity, you've got to model it. If they don't see it in you, it's never going to be a part of who they are. Uh, and we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about that next week when we're uh, at the beginning of our next lesson. Guys, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for the input. You're always free to kick things in. I am not an expert. <laughs> Let me repeat that many, many times. <laughs>